Greetings in the name of our Lord. Well, we might be at the end of things because, believe it or not, I got my COVID shot this week. They started doing clergy, of all things, and so I got my first shot this week. So I'm hoping that very soon we'll be through the worst of this pandemic. I hope that those of you who got your first shots are uh, doing well and keeping safe. We're going to begin our time of worship today with prayer. Let us pray. On this Passion and Palm Sunday, we recall, O Lord, the shouts of glad Hosanna with which the people greeted Jesus. They were ready to hail him as the Christ, but he was not the Christ for whom they were looking. They were looking for a wearer of the purple, but he had traded the robes of royalty for the garment of a servant. They were looking for a sword-wielding warrior, but he came praising the makers of peace. They were looking for the one who would cater to the cries of the high and mighty, but he ministered to the needs of the meek and the lowly. Today, O Lord, let us both recall and reclaim the life and the ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. Let our shouts of glad Hosanna portray the Christ who has come. Amen. Hello, and it's good to talk or share with you uh, again. This particular children's time is for Sunday, March the 28th, which is Palm Sunday. Uh, Hard to believe, but it's already coming up on Easter. Today I want to talk to you about something I'm sure you're all very familiar with. And that is what this big thing is. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? That's a calendar, isn't it? This is actually the month of March. And calendars are really kind of neat because they tell us what day it is. It tells us what things are coming. Uh, On every calendar, there's marked special days. Like on the 17th here. It's, it's about, it says St. Patrick's Day. And over here on the 20th, it says spring begins. On every calendar, there are always days that are special. Well, you know what? There's also weeks, weeks that are special. And here's one I've marked with the next. That's today. Today marks a very special day. It's called Holy Week. This is a very important week in the church calendar because this is the week we remember all the incredible events that Jesus went through making his way to next Sunday. We'll get to that in just a minute. So first of all, we have this coming Thursday, which is called Monday Thursday. No, not Monday, Monday. And it simply means a commemoration of the day in which Jesus at the Passover took a towel and washed his disciples' feet. You've probably heard of Good Friday. Good Friday is a tough one. Good Friday is the day where Jesus was crucified and he died. But I bet you remember what next Sunday is. It's Easter. That's right. And we recognize next Easter or next Sunday that it's Easter, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. Very exciting day. But today is a special day, too. Today is Palm Sunday. Today is the day we remember that Jesus rode a donkey as he came into the city of Jerusalem. And it was kind of like a parade. I don't know how many of you like parades. I kind of like parades. And this particular parade, people cut branches off of trees, palm branches, and they waved them and they threw their coats down on the ground and they said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna is an important word. It lets us, it means save us now. So the people recognized that Jesus perhaps was coming to save them and they were very excited about that. Although riding on a donkey confused him, but that's a story for another time. Palm Sunday was very special. And actually, because it was a parade, I bet the children, I bet the children who were there found it extra exciting. I mean, who who as a child doesn't love a parade? And I'm sure they got excited about Jesus coming. Well, I'll tell you, this is a special week. It's perhaps the most important week in the church year. I hope that you will enjoy this week, maybe with a touch of spring in the air. 
but you will also remember each and every day how far God went to show his love to us through Jesus. So have a good week. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this holy week in which we are now beginning. We thank you for Palm Sunday that remembers the time Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and the people waved palm branches and said, Hosanna, Hosanna. We also will remember this week on Thursday, Monday, Thursday, when Jesus took a towel and a basin and washed his disciples' feet, showing us that we are to be around, not to be served, but to serve. And of course, there's Friday, Good Friday. We remember what Jesus did on our behalf by dying on the cross. And of course, we're looking forward to next Sunday to celebrate once again that Jesus rose from the dead and he's alive now and he's with us now. Bless us this week, Father. Help us to celebrate you and help us to celebrate the life that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. It's wonderful to share with you and I hope that you have a great week ahead. Take care. Our gospel lesson for today is from John 12, verses 12 to 19. And there we find these words. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. 
His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the word of the gospel. Thanks be to Christ. (coughs) Who's the fool now? Now, this is not a Father's Day message, but I was thinking about my father this week. My dad is a wonderful man. He's very kind, he's loyal, and he has a good sense of humor, even if it is sometimes unintentional. However, at the risk of embarrassing him, I share that there is one thing about him that most people don't know. My dad is very particular about his recycling. Every week, he spends an enormous amount of time arranging his blue box to prepare for its pickup. The paper and cans, etc., are neatly arranged. They're not just thrown in. My mother remarked one day that his obsession with the blue box was thoroughly unnecessary. The collectors could not care one whit about how his blue box looked. However, Mum spoke too soon. Not long after Mum's comment, Dad happened to be at the curb when the recycling truck came around, and the collector asked my dad, is that your blue box? And Dad said, it was, of course he said that. The collector then stated that my dad had the best blue box in the entire city. Well, there was no critiquing his recycling efforts now. I'm afraid I do not take after my father on this one. I do separate the paper from the other stuff, but it's hardly considered neat. I am, however, a huge fan of all the blue box activity that we undertake. Recycling, I've decided, is besides being environmentally sound, is frugality at its best. It makes sense to reduce, reuse, and recycle as much as we can. As a group of people, farmers may be the best recyclers around, having tried to reuse things for hundreds of years before it became fashionable or necessary for the rest of us. Case in point is the following experience that I personally had. Some of you may remember that for nine years of my life, I was a farmer. Along with Laura, we ran a Christmas tree farm out at Selkirk, Ontario, which was just down the road from the provincial park. We had greenhouses for annual flowers, and I also spent time cultivating and selling nursery stock. As part of what we did, I have vivid memories of cleaning out our manure pit. A fun job, to be sure. I trimmed trees, I mowed the rows between the trees, and my least favorite thing of all was spraying pesticide. Actually, for the last couple of years that we lived there, I gave up spraying because it was so harmful both to the wildlife and to myself. And in Ontario, to buy and use agricultural pesticides and herbicides, you have to be licensed. And as part of that licensing process, you had to take a course and then you had to write an exam. The process has to be repeated every five years and I undertook it twice. The problem with pesticides, besides the obvious chemical danger in handling and application, is what do you do with the empty containers that once held those pesticides? At some farms, the number of empty containers can be quite significant, and you cannot just throw them out with your regular garbage. Most retailers who sell the pesticides are now required by law to take them back, but what do they do with them? No matter how much you rinse them out, they still have a residual pesticide locked in the plastic. During my second run through the course and test, we were given demonstration of one innovative solution to the problem of these waste containers. Into the classroom, our instructor brought a nine inch long cylinder that was 
mostly gray in color, but had several flecks of color throughout. The instructor went on to explain that the cylinder was a small sample of a much longer fence post. Perhaps you've seen in rural areas or even in many parks, farm fence posts, those round ones. Usually they are wooden, but in this case, our instructor showed us one that was made of compressed recycled plastic from pesticide jugs. I had to admit that I was impressed. It was simply ingenious to use a waste product to make something so useful. And in this case, something that would last considerably longer than a traditional wooden post. I am really intrigued with people who can take something that we normally throw away and make it into something useful and even desirable. Actually, I think we all admire this. Otherwise, we wouldn't do, take to recycling so well. I've always wished I could come up with an idea to take what is garbage or some kind of waste and somehow turn it into a valuable commodity. You see similar things like that all through nature. What actually is honey? That delightful nectar of nature. Well, it's nothing other than bee spit. <laughs> I love mushrooms in all kinds of forms and in all kinds of dishes. And I still love them despite knowing where, what the material is that mushrooms grow in. When grapes are pressed into juice for wine making, the fermentation process is actually yeast, one-celled animals, eating the sugar and then giving off waste. And then there's the dove, that beloved Christian image. How, a dove, however, is just a poetic name for a trash bird called a pigeon that causes no end of headaches for apartment dwellers in this town and around the world. And yet God used it as a symbol for the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself grew up in a place that was actually thought of as a trashy place called Nazareth. Nathaniel said of Jesus, can anything good come from there? And let's not forget where Jesus was born. Not in a sterile hospital or even in a nice room in a house. He was born in a stable. And what goes on in the stable of a barn? I know because I used to try and manage the results of what went on in the barn. What were Jesus' first smells when he entered life? Animal waste. And then there's Jesus' death. He was crucified at a place called Golgotha, which was actually at the dump in Jerusalem. Jesus smell, or died smelling garbage. Now, I know you're probably uncomfortable with these images, and that's a good thing. Because the first thing we need to know about how God works in this world is that he takes life and he turns it upside down. What we think is important or valuable, God rejects. And he takes what we reject and makes it invaluable. Time and time again, the scriptures tell us that what we think is weak and most despised and most contemptible in your life and mine can become through the power of the Holy Spirit what is most beautiful, what is most radiant, and what can produce the most blessing. God can turn trash into treasure, just like empty pesticide containers can be turned into useful fence posts. God just loves to take things in this world and turn them upside down. If you don't believe me, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and begin to read at verse 18. Here is some of what Paul talks about. I know very well how foolish the message of the cross sounds to those who are on the road to destruction. But we who are being saved recognize this message as the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy human wisdom and discard their most brilliant ideas. If you want to be first, Jesus says, you've got to be willing to be last. If you want to be strong, you have to be willing to be weak. If you want to win, well, you've got to be willing to lose. That is what this holy week, this whole week is all about. 
It is Jesus demonstrating what God's values are. And quite often those values are clearly at odds with the rest of the world. And nowhere is this truth more powerfully demonstrated than when Jesus enters Jerusalem. As we know, for approximately three years, Jesus has traveled around the countryside teaching, meeting people, and most impressively, performing incredible miracles. In many very overt ways, Jesus has demonstrated to anyone who cared to see that he was the Messiah. The miracles, the symbols, the predictions, all pointed to the fact that the one Israel was looking for was Jesus. Now, opinions on Jesus were mixed, partly because of his background, believe it or not. He was reminded often that he was from Nazareth, that he was just the son of a carpenter. But a significant number of people began to believe that he was the chosen one. The blind who regained sight, the lame could walk again, the lepers were cleansed, and most recently, Lazarus had been raised from the dead. All these things screamed that indeed Jesus was the Messiah. Now as the Passover, the highest and most important or significant holiday in the Jewish year, drew closer. Expectations just got crazy. They went to an all-time high. Now would be the very best time and opportunity for Jesus the Messiah to make his intentions known to the world. But what exactly were those intentions? Now, common belief and expectation among the people of Israel in Jesus' day said that the Messiah would come and bless Israel by driving out their oppressors. In other words, people in Jesus' day commonly held that the Messiah was to be a military leader. There was a whole group of young men in Jesus' day who developed into a kind of a rebel army. They were called zealots. And they took to trying to physically overthrow Rome's rule. And it's interesting to note that Barabbas, the one the Jews chose over Jesus, was likely a zealot who was arrested for attacking and perhaps even killing a Roman soldier. In fact, some of the disciples were believed to be zealots. As we see when Peter immediately grabbed a sword to cut off the high priest's ear in the garden. Many other ears were inclined to Jesus, just waiting for him to announce, take up your swords, drive the awful Romans out of this land. I should also tell you that many scholars have come to believe that this desire to see a military move by Jesus may actually have been the motivation behind Judas's betrayal. Some have speculated that Judas betrayed Jesus to force his hand. Surely Judas thought, when the soldiers come for him, he will call his people to arms. Yet, as I said, God's ways are not our ways. And often they seem to be at odds with each other. As the crowds long for a military ruler, Jesus chooses to enter the holy city riding on what? A white charger like some conquering general? No, he rides on a small donkey, a colt actually. Why? Well, historically, when a king came to a neighboring kingdom or even one of his own cities, if he wanted to demonstrate peace, he came not riding on a horse, but riding on a donkey. Donkeys, in Jesus' day, were symbols of peace. Imagine what would have happened if Jesus had come in on a white horse of some kind. How far do you think the Romans would have let him travel into the city? Yet Jesus is the Messiah. He is the King of Kings, and he comes to bring peace, not war. The Israelites believed their salvation and their hope came from the point of a sword not from, and from military strength. What Jesus demonstrated was so unexpected that when he was arrested and lashed and humiliated, the crowds that cheered his coming 
abandoned him and called for his death. They see Jesus so as far removed from the mark of what they thought the Messiah should be that they reject him. Let's go back to the Apostle Paul again in 1 Corinthians. And there he writes, God's way seemed foolish to the Jews because they want a sign from heaven to prove it is true. And it is foolish to the Greeks because they believe what agrees with their own wisdom. So we preach that Christ was crucified. The Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. Just look at how confused Pilate was in John chapter 18 when he's investigating Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, is this your own question or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate said. Your own people and the leading priests have brought you here. Why? What have you done? And Jesus answered, I am not an earthly king. If I were, my followers would have fought when I was arrested by the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate replied, you are a king then. And Jesus said, you say that I'm a king and you are right. I was born for that purpose. And I came into the world to bring truth to the world. All those who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. And what did Pilate say in response? What is truth? And we continue to echo Pilate's question 2,000 years later. We see how the world works, you and I, with its hunger for power and influence. And we see how Jesus rides in on a donkey, and we wonder just how sensible his approach is. Couldn't God have just forced us into believing in him? Couldn't he have just used some sort of cosmic bullhorn to shout the truth into our hearts? Instead, we read of a procession on a donkey and of a crucifixion, and we think, how offensive, how nonsensical. It makes so little sense. It is not how the world works, and certainly not what attracts the world to want to follow anyone. No wonder the Pharisees objected to the crowd's praise of Jesus on Palm Sunday. Because they too wanted to say, wanted in their hearts to say, this isn't what we want. This isn't who we want. Stop shouting and stop praising him. In fact, they went so far as to ask Jesus himself to stop the celebration. It was as if they were saying to Jesus, even you must realize how ridiculous this parade is. You must be aware you cannot be the Messiah because you're not what we expect or want. But the Pharisees were not the arbiters of truth. Even if the disciples had remained silent that day, Jesus says the very stones under their feet would have cried out. For the next seven days, this holy week, we will relive how God turned our world upside down. How God took what was seemingly a monumental failure, namely Jesus' crucifixion, and turned it into the greatest victory of all. How God took the humiliation of Christ and turned it into the greatest blessing. Most of all, we will see how God took the curse of hanging on a tree and transformed it into the miraculous act of forgiveness and salvation. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, Paul writes, that few of you are wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God deliberately chose things that so things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose those who are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised of this world, things counted on as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important, so that no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has turned our world upside down. He has shaken everything that we know in order to redeem what we thought was lost and to give value to what we would consider worthless, namely our very selves. 
hopefully on this Palm Sunday, you've helped, I've helped you recycle your ideas about who Jesus is and what he stands for as you journey to Good Friday and Easter morning. Please join me in a time of prayer. Gracious God, our Savior, we marvel at your presence in Jesus. As we ponder the events that we remember during Holy Week, we like to think that if we'd been there, we would have treated you with the respect you so right, rightly deserved. We like to believe that we would have found majesty and lowliness, greatness and meekness, strength and nonviolence, truth and service and glory and sacrifice. We like to believe that we would have seen with our eyes and heard with our ears, understood with our hearts and recognized Jesus of Nazareth as the servant of the Lord and Christ of God. That instead of a crucifixion, there would have been a coronation and that the triumphant entry would not have been mocked by Good Friday. But we know, O oh God, that if we had been there, the outcome would have been the same. The only difference would be that our names would be recorded instead of the disciples, and the Jewish leaders, and the Roman conspirators. As we recall the events of Holy Week, we recall the participation of the main characters with pain and anguish. For we know we've walked in the shoes of each of them. Like Judas, we have put money ahead of loyalty to Jesus. Like the disciples in Gethsemane, we have put physical comfort ahead of loyalty to Christ. Like the chief priests, we have put inherited belief ahead of loyalty to Christ. Like Peter in the courtyard, we have self-interest ahead of loyalty to Christ. And like Pontius Pilate, we have put public pressure ahead of loyalty to Jesus. We have not mocked Christ by crowning him with thorns. Instead, we have mocked his call to pick up our crosses and follow him by turning and walking away. We beg your forgiveness, O God, for our presence in the company of those who mocked your son. Yet we are more embarrassed by our absence from the company of those who remain loyal to Jesus. After Calvary, those who abandoned Jesus in the garden ended up dying for the sake of their loyalty to Jesus. So did the Apostle Paul, as of thousands more who have followed you, risking honor and fortune, reputation, health, and even life itself for the sake of the will and the claim of Christ Jesus. We ask your forgiveness, dear Lord, for our failure to follow in their footsteps. We pray for courage that we might relieve Simon the Cyrene of the burden of having to bear the cross of Jesus alone. We pray, O oh God, that the light that brightened the path of Calvary will illumine our path. Lead it not, let, us, let it not only lead us to do as Jesus did, but let, us, let also, it also lead others to join in making the mission of Jesus their mission. Let us hear our Lord say to them and to us, upon observing our common response to the hungry, the naked, the imprisoned, the sick, the homeless, the aged, and the oppressed, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, you did it to me. We recall, O oh God, the prayer of Jesus to be spared the cup of agony, but he put your will before his prayer. Let us dare to repeat that same kind of prayer. But let us not refuse the cup of agony if you ask us to drink from it. Father, we thank you for our Lord. We thank you for this holy week. We thank you for all the things that will happen that we remember in the next seven days. Help us to live as Jesus would want us to live. Be with us now as we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. the benediction for us uh, just a couple of notes there will be a virtual good friday service with the communion element as part of that uh, you may want to procure uh, juice and, and bread to be ready for that 
and we will also repeat virtually communion on Easter Sunday. However, there's also an in-person service on Easter, and those details are in Janet's email to you. Let me now dismiss us with a word of benediction. This day reminds us of the worst and the best we see when we look in the mirror. On the one hand, we see the selflessness, the fear, the greed, and the cowardice that make Calvary inevitable. On the other hand, we see the selflessness, the confidence, the grace, and the courage that make Calvary possible. As we praise the one who hung on the cross, let us not spurn the path that led him there. Amen. God bless you all.